Thank you guys. What an incredible morning of worship. Hey, it's great to be with you here in Oklahoma. And I've been looking forward to this uh, since the moment that I was invited. And so, uh, Dr. Thomas, thank you for, number one, first and foremost, your friendship. That means more to me than any invitation I could get. So thank you for that. But thank you for the privilege of, of coming here and Dr. Kearns for the privilege of, of being a part. Dr. Kearns has known me since I was 17. That's a little scary, but, uh, but I'm thrilled to be here. I want to invite you to turn in your Bibles, on your iPhone, your tablet, whatever, to Acts chapter 16. And as I think about when I do these, as I think about, man, what would I have wanted someone to tell me when I was sitting in your seat? And by the way, it wasn't that long ago. What would I want somebody to tell me? What would I want somebody to lay before me that would get me to thinking through the trajectory of my life? And it's a real simple principle, but the complexity of it is how does it apply to your life and to my life individually? Some of you are at the brink of graduating and you're trying to go, okay, God, what do you have for me? What's next for my life? And so I believe this is a word for you today. I want to speak to you simply on this topic, living a fully surrendered life. Now, I believe with all my heart, and I was praying through this last night, I believe with all my heart, there's some of you in this place that God's going to speak to today through his word and through the, the example that we see that Paul lives a fully surrendered life. But, but you got to know that, man, because of the significance of what God's wanting to do and say in you and through you, that the enemy is out to distract you. You're kind of like my wife. So my wife and I, we just celebrated 20 years last month. And so we got married in college. And uh, if that's God's will for you, I highly recommend it. If it's not, then I highly don't recommend it. But uh, we felt that was God's call for us. And uh, so we began dating, and I knew that this was the woman for me. Like I knew that I wanted to spend the rest of my life, that she was going to be God's greatest gift uh, to my life apart from salvation. So I knew that in order to do that, I had to get a ring, right? And so I, I had to go get a job and then two jobs and then three jobs. And ultimately, I worked four jobs in order for us to get engaged and married. I was a part-time youth minister on staff at a church. I was an RA in a dorm, and that was awesome. Uh, I sold used cars on Saturdays. And then I worked at a funeral home picking up dead bodies at nighttime while I was a student. And uh, man, what an eclectic opportunity. But listen to me, I loved this lady so much that I was willing to pick up dead bodies for her. And so I finally saved up enough money and I went and I shopped and I got the ring and I went up and I asked her dad, I said, uh, he's a man of few words, he's, he's a retired uh, um, a lieutenant Colonel out of the Air Force, and I, I got up all the courage I could. He was washing dishes, and, and it was the only time because she lived about six or seven hours away that I could ask him. Man, I just shared my heart with him, like how much I love his daughter and how much I want to uh, be uh, her husband and spend the rest of our life together. And I asked his blessing, and he looked up at me, and here's what he said, good for you. And he put his head down, and that was it, man. But that was enough for me. So I got the ring, and I began practicing what I was going to say to her. I wrote it out. I practiced it in the mirror. I put the ring, I went to the bank and got a safety deposit box and put the ring in that box. And man, it was going to be perfect. My wife is from San Antonio, Texas. And if you know San Antonio, there is a restaurant downtown that goes way up and it, and it has a ball at the top and it spins real slowly as you're eating dinner. And so on spring break, it was going to be her birthday. And so I planned it out months in advance where I was going to take her to this restaurant. And on her birthday, I was going to get down on one knee, embarrass her in front of the whole restaurant with the backdrop of her city and ask her to be my bride. Man, I was so pumped about this. I was so ready for this. So on spring break, we leave school. We begin heading to, towards her house. We get about an hour down the road, and I said, baby, I got to tell you, man, Thursday night is going to be epic. It's going to be the best night of your life. And, man, I, I just can't wait, and uh, I, I'm going to give you the best gift you've ever gotten. Now, ladies, I know you're thinking I'm talking about the ring. I'm not. I was actually talking about myself, but that's okay. We'll get on the same page here in a minute. And so she looked at me. She said, Nathan, we can't go out on a date Thursday night. I said, what? She said, oh, no, no, no. I, I, I babysit for a family, and I told them we would come back on Wednesday night. They've got a meeting on Thursday night. I've got a babysit on Thursday. Man, Nathan, I'm sorry. We can't go out on Thursday night. Now, uh, i just give you a little word for you single ladies in the house here today. Great advice. Men don't have a plan B, okay? 
Just know that. It's not like not within our ability to have a plan B. And so, and so she says, we can't go out. I've been planning this for months. I mean, I've been practicing like a fool in front of the mirror with this speech. And, and I'm going, what do you mean we can't go out? And she said, we can't go out. And so I, I, I said, fine, I'm not giving you your gift. She said, oh, no, 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 just give it to me now. I said, I am not giving this thing to you now. She has no idea what is waiting. In fact, I later found out she thought I was going to give her a lamp. Now, I'm just telling you, you buy your girlfriend in college a lamp, you're lame, dude. I'm sorry. <laughs> and so, and so, so, so she says, no, just give it to me now. We begin arguing for the next 10 miles. And I'm like, baby, I can't give this to you now. She's like, oh, it's just a birthday gift, man. It's not a big deal. Just give it to me now. And I like, can't do it. So ladies, one more uh, word of advice. There is a line in a man's mind that once you go over the line, it is the point of no return, man. Can I get an amen, guys? And so she said, just give it to me now. I said, fine, I'm done. So I did what I knew to do. I found the next church parking lot I could find. I pulled in in Brownsboro, Texas, on the side of Highway 31 in East Texas. I get out of her Mustang. I go and I open the trunk to get that lamp or that ring. And uh, I, I, I begin to walk up to where she's at on the passenger side. And my heart is beating. And can I just tell you, everything I had practiced for months escaped my mind in the moment. Because I wasn't ready for it. And I opened her door. And I got down on one knee with her ring. And right when I was about to ask her to marry me, I looked at her. And before the words could come out of my mouth, she goes, oh, no, 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 no. Don't do this here. <laughs> we just celebrated 20 years, I have to tell you. But listen, men, let me tell you something. Single guys, let me give you a word of advice. You just can't win sometimes, all right? Suck it up and go on, all right? Hey, I say that to say, listen to me, we're going we're gonna to walk through this passage very quickly, but here's what I'm going to say to you. For somebody in this place, God's got something on the forefront of your life that today when you say, man, I'm going to be fully surrendered, the enemy's going to say, man, don't do this here. Like, you can't do this. I've got something else to distract you with. I've got something else, another path to lead you down. You don't need to listen to what God wants. You don't need to listen to what the wisdom in your life is telling you. You're getting, no, you need to do what you want to do, what brings you happiness, what brings you pleasure in the moment. And I'm telling you, listen to me, students. If, I'm telling you, if you will fully surrender your life to the things of God, he will put you on a trajectory that your finite mind cannot even comprehend today. He will take you places you never dreamed. He will allow you to do things with your life through him that you could not comprehend. This is what we see in the life of Paul. Paul is desperately wanting to go to Asia. And in Acts chapter 16, he says this, And they went through the region of, of Phrygia and Galatia, and had been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. And when they had come to Mysia, they attempted to go to Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus did not allow them. So passing by Mysia... They went down to Troas, and a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man from Macedonia was standing around him saying, come over to Macedonia and help us. And when Paul had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go into Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. Now, laying this out this morning, what, what is happening with Paul? What's going on with Paul? Well, Paul so desperately wants to go to Asia. Man, he is desiring to go take the gospel to this people group. And his heart's desire is that, 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 that the gospel would, would penetrate into the hearts of those in Asia. But yet, there's a major problem. You know what the problem is? The problem is, as he's wanting to go to Asia, God says, nope, you're not going to Asia. As his desire is that he would, 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 would go and take the gospel, which, by the way, is a good thing. But even good things fall at the hands of God things. Even good things fall at the hand of God things. Hey, guys, let me do this, okay? Everybody pay attention real quick. Uh, I'm not important here. Uh, and I know you're looking around. Let's just stop and pray, Okay. Let's just stop and pray. I don't know what's going on, but God does, and we have professionals here, and uh, let's just stop and pray. All right, would you do that with me? Father, I don't know what's going on, um, but God, you do. Nothing in this moment takes you by surprise. And so, Father, as the professionals in this room are dealing with a seemingly medical issue, God, we just pause. We lay it at your feet. 
Father, we know that in this moment, you have something very special for us. But we also know that in this moment, that God, you are stirring in our hearts a sensitivity to what's going on. So God, we just lay it at your feet. And Father, for the student who is being attended to, I just pray for peace. I pray for healing. God, I pray in this moment that you would touch their body, give wisdom to these professionals. And Father, I also pray in this moment that the enemy wouldn't rob this moment for a student that needs to fully surrender their life to you. And so, Father, would you be God in this moment? Sovereign in this moment, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. You know, sometimes we don't understand what, what's going on, but one thing we have to understand is that when God has something in this moment, I, I used to hear somebody say when, when, when God is building a church, the devil builds a chapel next door. And in a moment where I believe that God wants to do something so significant in your life, of course, there's going to be times where things begin to try to rob us from hearing the voice of God. And so, students, I want to ask you to, to lean in. We have professionals here. Just lean in because I believe God wants to speak to you. And we're going to, we're going to abbreviate this today because I believe that, 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 that there's a purpose and a plan even in this. And so I want you to understand what Paul wanted to do. Paul wanted to go to Asia. He desperately had a plan for his, for, for his next steps. He, he, he really wanted to go see the Asian people. It's a good thing, but it's, it wasn't a God thing for him. God had something greater than him. So Paul wants to go to Asia, and it says the Spirit wouldn't let him. Hey, for some of you, you're going to launch out of here, and you're going to have this great grand plan for your life, and, and you're going to get frustrated because God's going to begin to pull you in a different direction. God's going to be put you on a trajectory that he wants for his glory and his name, but yet the truth of the matter is you're going to get frustrated by that. I, Paul clearly is frustrated because Paul wanted to go to Asia. He wanted to go into this people group, but yet God was saying, Paul, I've got something for your life that you can't fathom that I'm going to do. All you need to do is be fully surrendered. And so the first understanding that we have in the life of Paul is simply that, that, that really a fully surrendered life is a place where our dreams perhaps collide with God's desires. Our dreams collide with God's desires. And the truth of the matter is that you and me, as we are seeking the will of God, as we are seeking what God may want for our life, there are dreams that are going to be in our minds, but God says many are the plans in a man's heart, but the Lord directs his steps. And for many of you, man, you're going to battle that tension. Paul did. He wanted to go to Asia. God said no. So what does Paul do? How do, how do we know that Paul is just like us? Paul, <laughs> Paul then tries to backdoor it into Asia. So God says, no, you're not going into Asia. I've got something for your life. So what does Paul do? He tries to go into through another city to get to Asia. And it says the spirit of Jesus would not let him. And so no matter what he wanted, no matter what he tried to manipulate, God was saying, Paul, if you will surrender to me, I've got something for your life that you can't imagine. I've got something for your life that you can't even fathom. And the truth of the matter is, students, when we think about being fully surrendered to God, here's what it means. We've got to come to a place where our dreams collide with God's desires in our life. And what does it mean to be fully surrendered? It means that our dreams take a back seat to God's desires for our life. It means letting go and letting God do something that only God could do. It means letting go and watching what God does. So Paul wants to go to Asia. God doesn't let him. Our dreams collide with God's desires. When we live a fully surrendered life, we sacrifice our dreams on the altar of what God wants for our life. And then God takes us to places we never could dream. Number two that we see is we see that as Paul is trying to go to Asia, God says, man, you're not going to do it. He tries to backdoor it. God, it says the spirit of Jesus wouldn't allow him to do it. And so what happens after that? Paul goes to sleep, and a vision happens. And it's this man from Macedonia. It's, a, it's in Europe, and, and it's a man saying, listen, we need somebody 
to share the gospel here. We need somebody to come preach the gospel. It's a vision. It's a calling. And, and, and he says, we want somebody to come share the gospel. And so what happens with Paul? He says this in verse 10. And when Paul had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go on into Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. And so, in other words, what Paul wanted, God said, Paul, I don't want you to go to Asia. I've got something you can't see, you can't fathom, that's going to rock your world, man. And, and if you'll just surrender to me and lay your heart on the altar of my dreams for your life, my desires for your life, I'm going to do something incredible. And Paul, here's how it's going to start. This man comes in a vision and says, hey, come help us. And Paul says this, immediately we sought to go there, concluding that this was what God wanted us to do, to go preach the gospel. You see, here's the thing. A fully surrendered life is a place where your dreams collide with God's desires for your life. And you, in order to be fully surrendered, must lay down your dreams on the altar of God's desires. The second thing we see in the life of Paul here is simply this, that your yes must be on the table. Listen to this. Paul wanted to go to Asia. He had to live in the frustration that God wouldn't allow him to go where his heart desires. He wanted to go there. That's what he wanted to do. But what happens? God says, no, I want you to go to Macedonia because I'm about to do something you can't imagine. Now watch this. So Paul says, yes, Lord. You know, my wife and I, we try to live by this mantra. Yes, Lord is our answer. Now what's the question? Because we believe if we can position our heart to say yes, then it's not a question of task. It's a question of obedience. Am I going to be obedient? It's a question of yes, Lord, is my answer. Now, what's the question? Your yes must be on the table. This is what happens in the life of Paul. His yes is on the table. Even though he has a different desire, God says, I've got something for you. I want you to come here. And Paul says, yes, God, I will go. I will lay down what I want, and I will go. Listen to me, students. God has something incredible for your life. And, man, if you will live fully surrendered and sacrifice your desires for his desires for your life, your dreams for his dreams for your life. And you will say, God, I'll go anywhere, anytime, any place. You just direct me. My yes is on the table. Let me illustrate this for you. There's a young lady by the name of Kieran Watson. She was a missionary with the IMB. Kieran was 38 years old serving in the Middle East when her life was taken from her as a missionary. A few years ago, I happened to pass a a handwritten letter that I keep in my Bible that she wrote to her pastors in the event of her death. And here's what she says. Dear Pastor Phil and Pastor Roger, you should only be opening this letter in the event of death. When God calls, there are no regrets. I tried to share my heart with you as much as possible, my heart for the nations. Listen to this. I wasn't called to a place. I was called to him. I love this. To obey was my objective. To suffer was expected. And she says this twice. His glory is my reward. His glory is my reward. Here we have a lady whose yes was on the table no matter what it cost her. And ultimately for this incredible follower of Jesus, it cost her her life. But yet what does she say? To obey was my objective. To suffer was expected. But his glory is my reward. Therefore I say yes. This brave young woman went on behalf of you to take the gospel to an unreached people group and his glory became her reward. Hey, student, let me tell you something. You're going to struggle with the tension of what to do with your life. The enemy's going to say, don't do this here. Like, this is not the time. This is not the place. You don't want to surrender your life to God fully and wholeheartedly. But you want to know why? Because the enemy is scared to death of what God will do in you and through you. And here we find Paul saying, man, I want to go to Asia. God says, you can't go to Asia because i got a plan for you. Paul says, okay, well, what is the plan? Hey, you come here to Macedonia. Come preach. Come bring the gospel here. Paul says, yes, God, that's my answer. I'll go. And so it says, immediately we sought to go. Third and, and finally this today. Paul comes to a place where he goes to Macedonia, it says in verse 11, so setting sail from Troas, he made a direct voyage to Samothrace, falling dead in Neapolis, and from there to Philippi, which is a leading city in the district of Macedonia, a Roman colony. We remained in the city some days, and on the Sabbath day, we went outside the gate to the riverside, where we were supposed that there was a place of prayer, and we sat down and spoke to the women who had come together. Listen to this. This is very, very significant. And one woman who heard us, name was Lydia from Thyatira, seller of purple goods. 
who was a worshiper of God, the Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul. And after she was baptized in her whole household, she urged us saying, if you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. And she prevailed upon us. So understand, when we think about a fully surrendered life, we have to understand that that, that, that it's a place where our dreams collide with God's desires and we sacrifice our dreams on the altar of what God desires for our life. The second thing is that our yes must be on the table. We can't hold anything back to fully, fully experience the, 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 the plan that God has for us. We have to come open hand and say, God, yeah, my yes is on the table, whatever it is, wherever it is, whenever it is. But third is simply this, that the gospel must be prioritized over all. What do you mean, Nathan? Paul hears God saying, I want you to come to Macedonia. Paul immediately goes there. But he doesn't go there and say, okay, God, what's next? No, he goes there with taking the gospel there at the forefront of his mind. And he goes and he shares the gospel with this group of ladies down by the river. There is a lady named Lydia from Thyatara, that's going to be very important in a moment, from Thyatara who is there, who opens her heart to hear what he says and who gives her life to Christ. And here's what we know about Lydia. Lydia, as far as historians know, was the first convert in Europe that, that, was ever, uh, that was ever won to Christ in Europe. So for all we know, Lydia is the first person in Europe to ever embrace Jesus. And it says her and her household. Now, I want you to think about this with me through the, through the uh, t- uh, time frame of history about how many men and women God has used in unbelievable ways in Europe to advance the gospel. Now think about this, because we're about to connect some really cool dots. So Paul wants to go to Asia. God says, Paul, you can't go to Asia because I've got a plan for you. I want you to go to Europe because there's going to be some ladies there. I want you to share the gospel. There's going to be a lady that comes and gives her life to Christ. She's going to be the first convert in Europe. Her family's going to follow. And then, Paul, here's what you don't know. I am about to start a ripple effect of gospel advancement across Europe that's going to surpass generation after generation after generation. Let me, let me just say some of the names. If some of you are in theology classes, you may have heard some of these names that were either born in or ministered in Europe. Martin Luther, John Calvin, William Booth, George Whitfield, Charles Spurgeon, John Bunyan, Roger Williams. I bet nobody knows who that is. Roger Williams was the guy that came to America and started what we know to be the first Baptist church in America. Now, let's, you ready to connect some dots that are going to be mind-blowing to you what God can do and the same God that did this can do this in your life? Watch this. Paul wants to go to Asia. God says, no, I've got a bigger plan for you. I'm going to send you to Europe. Paul goes to Europe and and saying, yes, Lord. Paul goes to Europe. Paul wins Lydia to Christ, the first convert in Europe. A multiplication of the gospel begins to happen throughout generation through generation. These men and these women are raised up in Europe, and they spread the gospel across the continent. And there's a guy by the name of Roger Williams that has a call to get on a boat and come to this newfound land called America. He starts a Baptist church that 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 somewhere along the line starts a Baptist University in Oklahoma called Oklahoma Baptist University. And you and I today, listen, we are a beneficiary of Roger Williams feeling called to go to a new place and saying, yes, God, I'll go. We're a beneficiary, but it can be traced back. You and I sitting here today can actually be traced back to the river where Paul goes and shares the gospel with this lady in Europe. She gives her life to Christ and begins a gospel movement in Europe. But it can really be traced back to Paul coming to this place and going, God, this this is what I want in my life. And God's saying, no, man, I got something greater for your life if you'll just surrender. You see, you and I are beneficiaries of Paul living a fully surrendered life. Now, that's a pretty cool connection if it stops there. But watch this. Watch this. Where did it say Lydia was from? Thyatara. Thyatara is modern-day Akisar, Turkey. Does anybody want to take a wild guess what continent Akisar, Turkey is on? Asia. (laughs) Are you connecting this? Paul's heart beat to go to Asia. But God said, Paul, I can't send you to Asia because I've got a plan that I'm about to start a new gospel movement in a place called Europe that's going to spread from generation to generation. And at some point, there's going to be a guy that's going to go to a land that, that, that's not even been discovered yet. And he's going to start a gospel-centered Baptist church that's going to have a ripple effect throughout generations. And, and, and there's going to be a group of students in 2022 in a place called Oklahoma Baptist University being taught and trained and sent out. And he, listen to this. He said, but Paul, I, I'm not going to let you go to Asia 
because I got a movement that you can't comprehend I'm about to do to your life, but watch what I'll do. I'll take a lady from Asia, the people group that you love, the people group you want to meet, and I'll transplant her into Europe, and I'll let her be the, the, the catalyst for this gospel movement. If you don't think God, in his sovereignty, knows how to connect dots better than we do, you've lost your mind. So understand this. A fully surrendered life is a place where God's desire, your desire, your desires, your dreams collide with God's desires and you sacrifice them. It's a place where your yes must be on the table and it's a place where the gospel must be prioritized because God is in your tomorrow waiting on you to get there and he's already working in your life tomorrow before you even get to tomorrow in order to advance his gospel's purpose and gospel's advancement across the globe. Listen, friends, if God can take a guy who says yes, give him the desire of heart, but let him be a part of of a gospel movement that spreads throughout one continent into another continent that you and I are beneficiaries of today. What do you think God wants to do with your life if you fully surrender? So what do we do? Let me, let me close with this. I know you can't tell it, but I'm a runner. Well, I used to be a runner. I, I actually have a love-hate relationship with running. I hate it the whole time I'm doing it. I love it when I'm finished. 2012, I decided I was going to run a full marathon. Anybody ever ran a full marathon? 26.2 miles. I'm the only one. Yeah, you need to get out of your seat and go run. So I decided I was going to run. I train, I train, I try. I get to race day. I'm running, man. And, uh, man, I, 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 the most I'd ever run before that is 15 miles. I'm running. I'm looking for my family. I can't find them. About mile 23, they're there, and they are, they, they are holding up signs, you know, like uh, run, run, force, run, and come on, Dad, that, you know, you're slow, and, and uh, all those kind of things. And I'm like, okay, I see them, and I'm thinking to myself, I am going to motivate them. Like, this is a rare moment where I can motivate them to something that's pretty incredible. And I'm just, you know, my kids are there, and I'm just going to have this incredible speech. And I get up to them, and everything in my body is hurting at that point. In fact, I think things that doctors haven't even discovered were hurting in my body at that point. And so I'm running up and I look at my kids and before I can say this incredible motivational speech, all that came out of my mouth, my mouth was never again. <laughs> I'm telling you, man, it hurts. So I keep running. Mile 24, you get to the place where people start passing out and, and you step over them. And, and I get to this road and this guy, walk, he, he, this guy runs past me and he goes, hey man, keep it up. We're almost there. And I look at him, I do a double take. And I'm like, man, that's commitment. That's awesome. It was a guy that was running on one prosthetic leg and one regular leg. I'm like, man, that is awesome. I'm so glad my kids were able to see that. And then my carnal side kicked in. I'm like, but he shouldn't beat me, man. I'm 30. I've been training. Like, it shouldn't happen. And so I'm like trying, and he just takes off, man. He smokes me. Well, uh, you know, not, not, a, not a big deal. Uh, mile 25 and a half, like I'm almost there. I can hear them calling out people. Oh, 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 his name, and I, I'm like, man, man, I'm, I'm gonna, th I'm gonna do this. I'm gonna do this. Like, I I'm gonna get the bumper sticker, man. And this lady runs up to me and she goes, "Come on, honey, finish strong." And I said, "Yes, ma'am." And I took a triple take, and I'm like, "Ma'am, I'm not trying to be ugly or disrespectful, but how old are you?" God is my witness. Here's what she said: "Oh, honey, I'm in my mid 80s." I said, "Ma'am, what are you doing running?" A marathon. Lord is my witness. Here's what she said. Oh, honey, this is my second one this week. <laughs> like, I, at this point, I'm mall walking. You see those mall walkers with tennis balls in their hands and white teeth? Like, I'm, I'm running, but it's a very slow run, right? And so when she says that, I think to myself, there is no way I am letting her beat me to this finish line. And, man, I'm telling you what, I, I, I begin to run. I begin to dig deep. You ever heard a football coach say, man, in the fourth quarter, you got to dig deep, man. you got to dig deep. you got to give it everything you had. Let me tell you something. I dug to the depths of my soul as I watched her finish right in front of me. <laughs> I had tears coming down my eyes. My wife said, was it that emotional? I said, you have no idea. You say, Nathan, why are you telling us this? Because of this. I just gave you three scenarios. I gave you a guy who had a ma massive obstacle. He had one Leg and one prosthetic leg. Here I am in the middle. I'm 30. I was in optimal health. I had been running. I'd been training, and, and, and I was in the race. And then you had a lady here who, man, uh, shouldn't be running a marathon, but it was her second this week. 
Three different life stages, three different hurdles, three different difficulties, but one common thing. You know what that common thing was? We had to get off the couch and take the first step. You know what I learned that day? Marathons are not run in miles. They're run in steps. And you can't finish a mile or a marathon without taking the next step. And there are a lot of you in this room today, you're going, man, I don't know what God has for my life. I came here to get an education. I love it here. And whether you're about to graduate or whether you're trying to determine what your long-term major is going to be, you go, man, I don't know. But here's what I'm telling you. I don't know what God has for you. But what I know is God has something for you greater than you could ever dream yourself. God's not looking for your clever plans. He's looking for your surrendered heart. God's not looking for you to try to manipulate your future. He's simply looking for you to bow your knee and your heart before him and say, God, I'll do whatever you call me to do. So what do you do? You just take that next step. And that next step is saying, God, I want to get on my face before you and I want to cry out to you. And I simply want to know, what do you have for my life? Because, God, my answer is yes before you even tell me the question. Let's pray together. Father, I pray by the power of your Holy Spirit that you would move in the lives of these students. God, what a unique moment in time of their life. God, would you bless their efforts? God, would you, would you begin to speak into their life what you have for them? God, would you begin to position their lives and their hearts to, to say yes to you? God, if there's students here that don't know you, would you help them understand today you have something so much greater you can do in their life than they could ever do if they would just bow their knee and their heart to you and surrender their life to you and then surrender their future to you. Father, I pray for any student here distracted this morning that the enemy is saying, don't do this here. This would be a monumental moment where they say, you know what, I don't know what it looks like, but what I know, what I can't control, I'll trust with the sovereign God. What I can control is that I'm going to get on my face and surrender to him and fully walk in what he has for me. Bless their surrender today in Jesus' name. Amen.